when it's live it's live now good evening everybody welcome back to photography live and uncut i'm delighted uh with my guest this week uh, for you uh chris upton uh just join me chris welcome to photography live and uncut hi paul thank you very much for inviting me it's a pleasure to be here that's great absolutely superb uh, chris we made contact before the photo show and i took the time to come and watch your presentation with about the thorsby colliery and it just blew my mind. I've got to be honest with you. The imagery was fantastic. The prints were superb because you were doing the the presentation on the photo speed stand. But um, love your book. We're gonna we're gonna plug the book big time today. Here it Marvelous. is. <laughs> all about uh, all about the Thors, uh, Thorsby Colliery, which was closing down, and Chris had time to go up and take some images over a period of time. But we'll come to that later. Okay. Because really, Chris, the thing is, which surprised me in actual fact when you started the presentation, a, a study of this that, nature that you've done, although there is some landscape work in it, is not really what you would consider your genre preference. No, absolutely. So my passion really is travel and landscape. I guess I started out more as a landscape photographer many years ago in my youth when I used to um, record walks and climbs in the Lake District and Scotland and the Peak District. Um, and then over the years, the, the walking got less, the photography got more, uh, joined the camera club, and really that's when the bug really bit. And, um, and so I sort of morphed from, from landscape into travel, um, and we we're fortunate to have had quite a few nice holidays along the way. Uh, and, and really that's where I started to enjoy my travel photography. So yeah, that's, um, that, that's really what my passion is. But you know, it was really, really interesting because as a travel photographer, you know, you have to be able to master many different genres of photography, portraits, architecture, landscape, detail, maybe a bit of fine art, etc. And all of those things I had to do on the Thorsby project. So really yes. my experience and my training came in really, really useful. Yeah, it came in very useful. Uh, we, we will get to those uh, images later. We're going to take a good look at that, but obviously we're going to show some of your travel work as well. Let me take you right back. When did f photography really start for you, Chris? Um, I guess, well, my, my earliest recollections are that my, my dad was a really keen photographer um, and uh, you know, he, he, he did video as well at Super 8 it was at the time, not proper video, but Super 8. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and that's really what I remember taking little snapshots on a little Agfa, which I think I've still got up in the loft, actually. Oh, lovely. 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 Um, and, um, and so that was the start point, really. But, but as I say, it then moved on to recording these walks and climbs in the Lake District. And um, my first proper DSLR was a... Funnily enough, it was a Fujika, Fujika ST5, right, okay. I think it was. Um, and at that time, I remember doing uh, doing A levels and uh, doing some photography. And and the cameras to have as an enthusiast were either the Practicas of the Zenith, or yeah. we were really fortunate the Pentax Spotmatic. That's and right. We really, really, you know, lusted for one of those. But um, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting you mention those cameras because my first camera was the Zenith after a disastrous trip to Monaco, which everyone's heard me mention so many times before. When I went to Monaco Grand Prix with an Instamatic 110, um, <laughs> came back and realised I really enjoyed photography and bought myself a brick, a Zenith. But yeah. um, I always remember going into my local shop and I honestly can't remember seeing boxes of Nikons and boxes of Canons. They were all Practicas, Pentaxes. Yeah. Uh, the Zenits obviously were the, the, the used cameras. Um, yeah. and, and it's quite strange how, how times changed and how the Nikons and the Canons obviously became such a force in the market. Yeah, I think the Nikon, and I think Nikon was uh, preeminent then and I think probably that was for the press guys and yes. everything else. It was, you know, it was almost a Spotmatic, but then I think the cameras that really sort of turned the world upside down worked for me with the Olympus, the OM1 and the OM2. Yep. And I love those cameras and they were small and they were really well built and uh, such fantastic design. Yep. Um, yeah, and um, so it was, it was a joy to use those. But um, yeah, then progressed and, and moved on to um, Nikon film cameras. But when everything moved to digital, at that time Canon had a, a better foothold and so I decided to sell all the Nikon film gear and buy a mm -hmm. Canon. I think my first um, digital camera was a 10D. Uh, and when, when, when was that roughly then? Oh, blimey. Uh, would that be? 19... 
Ooh, would it have been about 95, something like that? Okay, yeah, so the late, getting on to the late 90s. Like that, I, didn't, I, I, I took a real sabbatical in photography for a period of time. I was a Nikon user, film cameras, and I started to get back into photography around about 2001. Yeah. But I, I had all this Nikon film gear and uh, sold it all for an entry-level Nikon digital and then built it up from there and of course uh, as as time has gone on uh, moved on to other equipment which uh, everyone knows which equipment i use that being the fuji now <laughs> um so when you were at school did you go to university after school or were no, you straight into no, work? i went straight to work and uh yeah went went straight out to work at uh, 18 and a half yeah and and mm-hmm. i ended the commercial what was work. that i was uh I, I was a sales representative i worked for the mars corporation um all oh, right uh, okay Actually, I spent the rest of my career. Um, so I had 30, 37 years there with Mars, um, progressing through and working in sales and marketing roles. And, uh, and then I took early retirement uh, with a plan to do more photography. I then got a call to say, would you like to come back and help us out? Uh, it's only for six months. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And six months became 15 months. Um, and so eventually I finished that um, probably about 18 months ago, just under two years now, probably. Um, okay, so so it, in that time working with, with Mars there on that second string, that's when you're starting to do more and more photography, your travel photography? Yeah, it was. And I think, I think one of the big changes, and you know, if people that have got, have got kids have, have all gone through the same situation, really. You know, your time, particularly when they're in their early teens, and I've got two boys and they were into the football, so it was very much... Yeah spending the weekends, you know, taking them to football, etc. cetera. Um, and so my photographic uh, trips were few and far between. It was family holidays with the odd weekend away here and there. Um, yeah. and, and that was it. But I, as the boys grew older, I was then able to do more, more trips and bespoke photo trips. Um, now, of course, they've left home. And, um, of course, I've got much more time now to be able to devote to, devote to my photography, which is... Yeah. Great, really enjoying it. In that, in that period of time where, where you're just sort of starting to, uh, the kids are starting to move on, uh, were you actually selling your photography at that point or was it just purely a pure... Yeah, pure no, I'd, with the camera I'd, I'd, I'd had a few exhibitions um, and what I found was that although I didn't have a lot of time to do the photography, whenever I did get out there, the results seemed to be pretty well received. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I put some images in the stock library and they seemed to go down quite well before the stock market crashed. Yeah, um, and they're still there, and they sell for a pittance now, and uh, you know that's that's a shame. Um, but um, but yeah, so I was I was doing little bits and pieces here and there, and um, so I did have a bit of knowledge to to build on when eventually mm. I, I retired. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we, we in terms of the photographic equipment now, we're into basically well into digital uh, Canon use. You started off with the 10D. Can you tell me about the development with the with the Canon equipment? What what you ended up? Uh, yeah. Um, well, after the 10D, I moved to the 5D Mark II. Um, okay. Yeah. L lenses, which was superb. I mean, really, really good. Um, and I went through a Canon 5D, and then moved on to the 5D Mark II. Um, and then my last Canon camera, which I still have, um, is a 6D. Okay. Which, which was a great camera. I've got a, a, quite a few L lenses, tilt shifts, the 24 to 70 f2.8, you know, version 2, which is a, a super lens, but they're big and they're heavy. And the turning yeah. point for me was that uh, my, my son, as part of his degree, was working in New York. And we okay. went out to see him. And, and although it was only April, it was unseasonably warm. And I remember walking around New York for all day with a rucksack with maybe 12 kilos of gear in it and carrying yeah. a tripod. And I just thought at the end of it, this is crazy. And the next time I went, which was about eight weeks later, um, I bought at the time, it was a, a Lumix G1. Um, yes. A G1 with a couple of lenses. And, you know, it was just so liberating to walk around with a shoulder bag yeah. um, and that Lumix camera and a couple of lenses. And it was just fantastic. And it brought a lot more enjoyment into the photography. Mm. Um, and as I say, the Canon gear is, is fantastic gear, but... It's not great when you're a travel photographer wandering around in, in fairly no, high. It, 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 it's a very interesting point you make, actually, because I've said this before myself, that uh, with regards to weight you're carrying in the line of business that I'm in, building exhibition stands, and I have a chance to go to, to, uh, to cities throughout Europe. I'm off to Dubrovnik in uh, about three weeks' time. 
uh, to carry a low pro bag on, on your back with two camera bodies, three, maybe four lenses, maybe a support camera as well, just in case. I also bought into the Nikon one series camera. So that would come out and then added to the weight on your back. The one thing that I found the most frustrating was what lens do I use? Yeah. Um, should I have the 35 on? Should I have the 50 on? Should I have the zoom on? And, and in the end, I was getting so weighed down, not only with the weight on my back, but making the decision of what to use. Yeah. Um, and finding a system which was light where you could basically condense it to maybe two or three lenses with, mm. with a, a decent camera, let's be perfectly honest about it, was uh, it brought photography back to me. I've said this many times in, in terms of the Fujis. That's exactly what it did. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, so, so where I was with the Canon gear, I, I then bought this, this Lumix which was okay but you know i'd always hankered after a rangefinder i really yeah. fancied a leica but could never afford one and, and all the lenses that went with it and so of course when fuji brought out the x pro one i immediately thought this is this this looks like a great camera but i went along to the um the photography show before it was the, the um focus on imaging that's before. right focus on imaging yeah yeah and, and i handled one and it, for me i just felt it was just a little bit big the body was a bit big so i thought oh, i'll hang fire and see what happens and then a year later, they brought out the XE1, and that yeah. for me was just perfect. And my idea was that I would have a small camera, bought the 18 to 55 zoom lens, and I thought this is just going to work alongside my DSLR. I can take this as a carry around camera anywhere. If I don't want to take the DSLR, I've got this. And of course, what happened, as has happened with many people, yes. is that you use the Fuji more and more, and then the DSLR less and less. And I think when you see the files that the Fujis turn out, there is something about them which is just super. The look and yeah. the feel of them, almost filmic. And I hadn't shot JPEGs for ages, and I'd read everyone waxing lyrical about JPEGs, so I started to shoot some. I couldn't believe it. And I found yeah. it difficult sometimes to almost match your RAWs to the JPEGs. Um, they're so good. It, this is so familiar in terms of conversation, a conversation I had with Karen Hutton, who... Uh, uh, had literally fallen over with uh, she's a landscape photographer and she'd fallen over with two Canon camera cameras bodies three or four lenses and and had sort of hurt her hurt her spine quite badly and she said I've got to buy some lighter gear uh, and the first camera she looked at was the Sony she didn't enjoy using the Sony uh, then she uh, I think she had a Lumix for a short period of time then she was given a Fuji and she couldn't believe the performance of the image from the files that she was getting from the camera uh, yeah. which in actual fact turned her towards effectively moving away from Canon to, to using Fuji and this is a very very important point because it's a one and a half crop sensor yeah. but they've done something really special with the sensor that produces these fantastic quality of images and when and when you're like me you do your printing uh, which we, you mentioned in the in the presentation there at the, at the show that's when it really starts to come home to you. It's all right, you're having a great image up on the screen, but when you can print from those images and the size of prints that you can produce is quite outstanding, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've got um, an, uh, an Epson 3880, so I print A2 images. Um, and, you know, I've got one on my lounge wall of, of some bluebells that were taken on the XE1 and the 18 to 55 lens. Uh, yeah. You know, and I think. I've just done a review actually of the uh, comparing the 1855 with the 16 to 50 for, for Fuji. That's probably going to come out soon. Um, mm -hmm. But that 18 to 55 is such a cracking lens. It's almost disparaging to call it a kit lens. I, I yeah. say this every time. It's not a kit lens. <laughs> no, it's it's, it's cr the only, I think the only, the only decent negative comment I've heard about it, and I do use this in, in a tentative way, is the aperture ring is not marked. It's yeah. a freewheeler. And that is the only thing which I would say is I wish they had. I know the later versions, uh, the 1655, I think, is marked, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, yes, uh, it is. So that is obviously the upgrade you've got of it. But that's the only side I think that that 1855 is not a kit lens. There's very few zoom lenses at that that sort of price. And actually, start at 2.8. Yeah. Um, they all start at 3.5. And that's another thing which uh, is a great aspect. And it is. It is a superb piece of kit. Uh, the other thing as well, of course, is the image stabilization, which yeah. you know, I can handhold that at a twelfth of a second. 
you know, yeah. I, and get sharp results. It's absolutely amazing. So when you're doing travel and you're in a you're in a church or a, a museum or something, and you're not allowed to use your tripod, you can still get pictures. Um, yeah, exactly. Which is, which is fantastic. And the other thing, of course, which a lot of people talk about is the ISO range. You know, you, there are some cameras previous to the Fujis. I would never have dreamt of going to 6400 ISO, which no. I use on my XE1 and the X100S. Uh, and again, you, you don't get this noise effect of the image, do you? You get a, no. a grain effect, a, a yes. proper film grain effect. Yeah, there's a few pictures in the Thorsby images, which I'm sure we'll have a look at uh, soon. Yes. And, um, you know, they were some of those were taken at 1600 ISO, and, yes. and and you know, in the background, in the dark area, it does look like grey, but the faces and the portraits are absolutely clear. Yeah, you know, handled them absolutely superbly. Um, the other thing I find as well is that I don't have to mess around with the white balance. You know, generally no. speaking, white balance as shot is perfect. Yes, and I think. Oh, it can't be right again. It can't be right again, and I'm I'm changing it. But inevitably, you know, invariably, I'll come back to the white balance as shot. Yeah, very very. Yeah, good. yeah, I've done that as well. Let's talk about Thorsby then before we go to screen share. Okay. How how did Thorsby come about? Thorsby Colliery. How did it come about, uh, Chris? Well, it was an interesting one because um, I'd like to say I was selected for it based on my work in in a similar area. But of course, having never really having done social documentary. That wasn't the case. In fact, I was giving a, a travel lecture to a camera club in, in Nottinghamshire. And at the end of it, a guy came up to me and said, you know, really like my pictures. Um, and would I like the opportunity to, to take some pictures at, at, at Thorsby Colliery? I guess at this point, I should just explain for people that don't know the, the area. Um, Thorsby Colliery is in, in the county of Nottinghamshire, where, where I live. Um, and um, the, the coal industry powered Britain through the Industrial Revolution, and there were hundreds of pits uh, around the country. And gradually, over a number of years, the number of pits, because of economic situations and political decisions, have declined and, and they've been shut. Um, and July 2015 was a landmark date in Nottinghamshire because Thorsby Colliery um, was the last pit in Nottinghamshire to close, and it brought to an end 900 years of mining in the county. So it was a huge mm -hmm. milestone event. Yes. Uh, but I was giving this lecture, the guy came up to me and said, would I like to take some pictures at Thorsby? And, um, and I said, yeah, I'd love to, thinking it would be probably just one or two visits. And yeah. he was a miner uh, and he was retiring, uh, sorry, he unfortunately just been made redundant. Um, but he got me the introduction and I went along um, and had a good chat with them and they showed me around and, and it was great. I got on well with them, still thinking it'd be one or two visits. Um, but actually, it evolved into uh, a year-long project from July 2014 till July 2015, and it closed on the 10th of July last year. Um, and I had 10 visits in that time, all different times of day. I remember going up almost, I think it was the longest day, uh, up onto the spoil tip at dawn to get some dawn images uh, on the longest day. And I have to say that UK Coal were really, really supportive of it. and. Um, you know, once they saw some images and saw sort of the quality that they were getting, they sort of encouraged me, and so that was great. The yeah. only thing that I didn't get was permission to go underground. This is, I was just going to ask you, the up one area which you mentioned, you weren't yeah. allowed to go underground. Yeah, and they said at the time, you know, it's just far too much hassle to get all your gear checked and, and, yeah. and um, you know, for safety, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just going to keep it to the surface. If I'm honest, I think with hindsight, having seen the work that I've produced, they probably would have, you know, um, gone out of the way to, to do all that and get me underground. But, you know, I think that every cloud has a silver lining. And I think with regard to this is, you know, if you Google mining pictures, invariably you see pictures of miners in tunnels hacking away at a coal face. But yeah. what you don't see is all the surface support areas and the workshops and so much of the portraits of the people, the officers and the landscape. You don't see yeah. that. And, and, of course, that's what, you know the local people see the people that don't go down the mine that's what everybody sees that's the visible mm. bit so you know it was good and, and and there's not that many of the sort of pictures that i've captured um around you know most of them tend to be as i say mm. miners underground Get, getting closer to the closing date must have been quite an emotional time for you and obviously for for the miners yeah i mean it it was interesting because to start with um you know, I just thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to concentrate on 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 the people so much. 
I'm just going to concentrate on the buildings and really get to understand the process, the workflow, you know, w where the coal comes from, where it goes. So the people I didn't have a lot of contact with, apart from being at the end of the pit banter, which was very, very interesting. Um, you know, yeah. they were a great group of guys. And of course, what that enabled me to do was over a number of visits, they got used to seeing me. And you start to see the same people every so often and you walk around a corner and there's this guy, you've already taken his picture three times and he, and he, and he starts, you know, swearing at you and saying, not again, no, sod off. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then, then he'll let you take his picture. So it's great. So I managed to build up this relationship with them before I then started to take the pictures. Yeah. And I have to say, in the early days, going back to your question, they, they, they seemed very, I mean, the, the closure date which when I started was going to be September, and it was pulled forward to July. Um, okay. So when I first started, it seemed to be quite a way away. So there wasn't, you know, it was just like business as usual. But what I did find was that as we approached, and certainly from sort of uh, after Christmas, Easter time, towards the summer, you could, there was a, there was a, you know, you could just fit, there was a tangible change in the atmosphere. Um, and people, you could hear people starting to talk about, have you got anything lined up? I mean, at its height, there were two and a half thousand people that worked at Thorsby. Uh, mm -hmm. And when it closed, there were just under 400. And for some of those people that were being made redundant, some of them were going to retire anyway. Um, you know, some, uh, it was probably a blessing and they've gone on to other things and got other jobs. And then unfortunately for others, they've struggled. And of course, the problem yeah. is that because it's, you know, it's potentially a very dangerous job. I mean, some of these guys were paid quite well, particularly the face workers, um, but they didn't have many other skills. And so no. for them, trying to find a job now that's as equally well paid is nigh on impossible for them. So there's all sorts of social repercussions. As yeah, well. so loads of, what, what in actual fact is the, is the community like now? With the, the colour is closed now. It hasn't reopened yeah. to any shape or form, has it? Well, no, and that's a really interesting one, Paul, because my, when I first thought about going up, I mean, I tend to be very sort of a planned person and organized. And what I did was I tried to pull together like a, a shoot list before I even went of the type of pictures I thought I might get. And one of the angles I was looking at was to shoot the community um, and the, the village, because what used to happen, of course, was that the pits were put up and then they built a community around the pits. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the village was the pit in the community. Now, yeah. what had happened is, as the pits had closed around Nottinghamshire, then miners from these other outer lying villages worked at Thorsby. So what you didn't have was that close community spirit that you might have had in oh, some oh, of the okay. more local pits. So what I chose to do was ignore that and then concentrate just on the site itself um there were a few other things that i'd taken pictures of and the railway sidings and there's a signal box and various bits and pieces but i didn't put those in i thought i'm just going to keep this tight now because you know i just i i, I think the other work that i'd looked at was some of david bailey's work and he did a project in the 80s on the valleys a wonderful piece of work and that was very much about the community and that's what i wanted to try and you know have a look at but of course that wasn't possible because it it had moved on since then and it was very different yeah um so this this obviously we, we uh, to, to do the work you decided to use the fuji and you've now moved into using the xt1 could you just uh, just give us a before we go to the screen share which we're going to this could you just give us an idea of what lenses you were taking and sure. also what about what about basically keeping your your equipment relatively clean in what must have been quite a a dirty place to work with respect Absolutely. to the workers there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the choice of, of using Fuji was um, was perfect uh, for a number yeah. of reasons. It was it was small um, and it, it was light. It was it was pretty robust. I also find that um, you don't get some of the problems I've had previously with dust on the sensor. The sensor te seems to keep pretty clean, actually, which is uh, which is a real godsend. Um, but one of the biggest advantages was that. Um, you know, when you try and take people pictures and you've got a big DSLR with a big lens on it, it can get yeah. quite intimidating. Yeah. And if you're a model, you're used to this, but even though you're a big burly miner, you know, you, you, they did feel rather, you know, um, sensitive and uh, awkward, you know, having the picture taken anyway. So I felt that it just helped me with a camera that was less obtrusive um, yeah. and less intimidating. To be able to use that and that that seemed to work uh, work really well um so the lenses that i used were i've got three 
um, zoom lenses. I've got the 10 to 24, the 18 yeah. to 55, and the 55 to 200. So most of the images, I guess, were taken on the 18 to 55, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, quite a few taken on the 10 to 24. But then in primes, I've got a 35mm 1.4, which I've just upgraded to the F2. Um, and that was brilliant for the environmental portraits. Really, really good. And I've used that wide, wide open. And there's one shot which we'll have a look at shortly, and I'll show you. It's a, a, you know, it's yeah. a cracking lens. And then the other lens, uh, prime lens, which I used, which um, really came into its own, was the 56mm 1.2. Um, mm. And what I did there was I took my studio lights up into the lamp room um, the day before it closed, and we had a, a portrait session where at uh, shift change time, there were some guys coming off shift, and they were all black, uh, and yes. some guys going on. But I just really wanted to give everybody the opportunity that was there to have a picture taken, which you know I was going to give them a copy of afterwards. And yeah. uh, I took about 50 portraits, and that was fantastic. And, and they're all in the book. I put everyone in the book. Yeah, um, the, uh, it's, uh, let me I just... We will show them, but there was, uh, I think, the, the items you're talking about here, these images here at the back here. That's it. These, yeah. uh, they're absolutely That's superb. It. And there's, there's no doubt about it. I'm, I'm hearing this. I haven't got it myself. The 56 one, two is just everybody I speak to. Yeah. It's a fantastic lens. I think there's a difference between the APD and the and the straight R, but I won't get into the technical part no, of that. It's not the straight one. It's not, it's not the late one. Not the, uh, the APD, but, yeah. I printed to A2, and you know the individual hairs on the eyebrows and the eyelashes. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's wonderful. Really, let's go to let's go to screen share. We'll, we'll do the Thorsby straight away, but then of course we will show your uh, your latest travel work uh, because okay. you've got some fantastic shots there uh, in a few of the Mediterranean uh, uh, cities you've visited recently. Um, I hope you can see this okay. Um, yeah, I got it. So uh, Thorsby Colliery, I'm going to go to up there. That's I'm going to get the images as large as I can here because I think one of the things which comes across in, in not only the presentation you gave at the show is is the print quality that comes out from from the Fuji file. Um, I'm just there we go. We can uh, see this is uh, the obviously the opening gate showing showing the wheel. But I think uh, it, it to me it's and I, I'm very careful when I say this. A black is black, and a, and a white is white in a, in a Fuji file and. And it, it, this, these sort of images we're going to see here, that's just beautiful, beautiful contrast that you've uh, been able to uh, create. Yeah, um, I, th I think, you know, that there were a few fundamental decisions which I took quite early on in the project. And probably one of the most important ones was, you know, how am I going to present this? Is this going to be in black and white or colour? And for me, yeah. it had to be in black and white. I think clearly there's a natural affinity being a coal mine. Um, sure. Black and white. But apart from that, um, there was a couple of other reasons. I think when you see some of the pictures, you, you know, the, these could have been taken 40, 50 years ago. And there's yes. a timeless feel with black and white, which is easier to, you know, it's easier to convey that in black and white than it is in color. Um, the other thing was that the white balance was pretty difficult in color as well, because we've got all sorts of horrible lighting, um, tungsten, fluorescent, bit, you know, very dim conditions. Um, and and therefore, you know, you don't have those problems with, with black and white. And then finally, the, the other factor was that the guy's obviously wearing bright orange safety clothing. And, yeah. you know, when you see that in a picture, your eye just goes straight to the... It's uh, a total straight. distraction, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just going to stop on this picture a moment. because no, this I've, I've, I've deliberately stopped on this one as well because there's a great <laughs> story to this one. Thank absolutely you. super. This is the, these are flame safety lamps and probably most yeah. people know those as Davy lamps and um, every miner had his own number and every miner had his own lamp and um, this, uh, this picture was actually blown up to three meters, yes meters by two meters yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw it. Show on, on the Fuji stand, it was incredible and it was wonderful to see a picture that big but a real mm. testimony to the quality of the, of the Fuji file um and um you know it's 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 a lovely picture a lot of people pass comment on it but one of the most pleasing things and what's happened over the period of time is that there's lots of little stories occurred around these images and uh, probably the viewers can't see it there but there's a, a lamp there that's number 90 and um i had a call just before christmas from a young guy and he said to me 
um, I've seen your picture on, on your website and, and the Telegraph actually um, puts uh, put an 18 image gallery online which was wonderful and really kicked off the uh, the, the whole show uh, really effectively for me. They, they, they supported it really well. But he, he contacted me and said, my dad's lamp number is 90. Um, you know, could I buy a print? And I'd love to get it framed for him for Christmas. So, of course, yeah. I was delighted to do that. And I printed it off, sent it off to him, sent him details of my exhibition, which opened just in, in, in January, and invited him to the open evening. And on that open evening, he came with his dad. Um, fantastic and so it was fantastic both to meet the guy who bought the picture and his dad and there were lots of stories like that um, i tell you I, I, just coming back on that three meter by two meter print it is hard to realize uh, a size of print from from effectively a one and a half crop sensor um but it it, it, it was it was three meters by two meters and i did the the thing which you should never do with a print go up to an, a totally unacceptable viewing distance in other words about three inches away yeah. to see where the grain was and to see where the noise was and i just about saw it at that that uh, that distance uh, uh, obviously to appreciate the whole image was to step about 10 foot back and to look at it and it was just a lovely lovely story of lamp number 90 which yeah. i remember you telling that and that's the reason why i stopped at this particular image yeah. because uh is poignant in the sense that am I right to assume that the numbers where there is no lamp, they are in, down the mine? They're either down or, the mine or or they've been made redundant and no longer work there. They've been made redundant. Okay. And for argument's sake, if someone had died, <clears throat> that number was never passed on. It was it was there for in Yeah, I, I don't think it was. No, You're not I don't sure. think it was. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. Great story on that particular image, and, and it's a wonderful image. Um, and uh, that image, in actual fact, was printed by. Uh, let's give them a plug. It was printed by Genesis, in yes. uh, in London, and uh, that's fantastic. And, and they did they did a whole host of stuff there as well. The yeah. other people's pictures on Fuji at a similar size, which were you know you know as impressive, if not more so. They were wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Genesis it, it was interesting actually because just a few weeks ago, I mean, I'm in the exhibition industry myself, and there was an image which I needed printed at a very large size, and. I, I called them up because of that lamp image. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I introduced myself and said, look, I've, I've seen this image that you printed for Chris Upton and go through. I said, what size file do you need to basically make it? I think I was looking for a two by one meter. And yeah. they said that, that wasn't necessarily the case of size of the file. It was the quality of the file, which yeah. I thought was a very, very intriguing way of describing. They said, if your customer wants to go down the road of printing that size, Let's have a look at the quality of the file and we'll tell you what we can print it to. Oh, it was nothing to do with the size of megabyte of the size yeah, of the file, it was yeah, the quality of yeah. the file. I mean, the interesting thing with that was that, well, many of my images were, were shot on a tripod. I mean, the conditions yeah. were pretty dim. So you had a situation like the one we're looking at there, where generally speaking, there's lots of, uh, lots of shadow areas and we've got these huge windows on the right hand side and the left hand side actually, with the sun mm -hmm. coming through from the right. So you'd got quite a lot of contrast in, in, in many cases. Some days it was overcast and it was easier to cope with. But actually, in this case, I quite like the shadows coming through. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was pretty tricky. But wherever I could, I used the tripod. And I think the, um, the exposure on the lamp shot was, uh, it was taken on a 10 to 24 zoom lens. Uh, okay. And it was, I think it was F13 at 1.3 okay. seconds. Uh, yeah. 200, it would be 200 ISO. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this this image was 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 great because um, I just felt that with all these storm clouds looming, it almost started to tell the story. And I was going to make yeah, this exactly. Story. It, um, it makes the place look so bleak. So, sorry, Paul. It makes the place look so bleak. Yeah. It, it, it does and there's bits there which have not which they started to uh, pull down I mean before I started going actually it had just been left so it almost looked like it was on its last legs and uh, uh, it was almost like the poor tents are not good for this uh, for, for this place um, but it was a uh, what I wanted to try and do um, in my planning was to take some wide shots some scene setting shots that could really tell the story uh, and then start to move in and get the detailed more detailed images later yeah um let's what i want to do now i just want to come out i'm 
if I come out, because obviously we haven't got time to go through every image as much as I'd love to, um, let's, let's start looking at some uh, portraits and some closer images here. There's three happy fellows here yeah. um, working away. At this at this point in the project, you, I get the impression you've, you've been able to build a very good sort of uh, relationship with, with the workers in the mine, and they knew why you were there. Yeah, um, yeah, they did. So all the way around, uh, alongside me, on every shot I took, I had a safety manager with me. Um, and oh, okay. It's interesting because, you know, you, you almost feel sometimes that, you know, you're time pressured because this guy's taking, you know, I went 10 times and each session was probably between two and three hours. So mm -hmm. Grant had to give up, you know, at least 30 hours of his time. Um, and he was with me every step of the way, looking after me, making sure I wasn't I wasn't going to fall down a hole or uh, trip over anything. Um, yep. But of course, he was then able to to talk to the guys whilst I was taking the picture, which was which was great. And um, you know, to start with, as I say, they were a bit sceptical, but they soon sort of warmed to me. And soon, as you can see there, there's a bit of a you can see that I've made contact with them. I've broken yes, that broken down Definitely. that barrier, and and yeah. that's what I try and do with my travel pictures. So. You know, on a on a travel trip, I'll I'll keep the camera out of the way. I'll have it prepared, on be set to go, with all the settings ready. But as I walk up, the camera will be out of the way, and I'll try and say a few words, you know, in a in a, in a foreign language and, and in their language, and uh, hopefully yeah, exactly. them wrong, it breaks the ice and they smile, and then yeah. I can sort of then say, could I take your picture? And exactly. and that's almost what happened here with these guys. You know, it's going, what are you doing? How long have you worked here? You know, and, and it's just and then feel at ease then and you get a much better result, um, you know, because of that. Lovely, a lovely image. Uh, this is one of my favourites in actual fact, uh, showing this this guy with just. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, you know, it's a good example, isn't it, where, you know, people pictures don't have to show faces. And exactly this right. really shows as much about a minor as, um, as, as showing a, a blackened yeah. face a helmet, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because. Uh, after I'd taken, or oh, maybe it was uh, February, March time, uh, I went to the photography show, and um, I, I, I know Steve Watkins from Outdoor Photography, and uh, he suggested yep. that I, I, I talk to Elizabeth Roberts from Black and That's White right. Magazine. And so yep. I went along to uh, Elizabeth, introduced myself, and I'd got about 20 images on my iPad, and I just sort of said to explain what I was doing, and said, could I just have a few minutes and just show you them? Uh, and she was very, very good indeed. She gave me the time and she looked through them and she stopped at this one and she said, wow. She said, you've got a feature. And I never Fantastic. say that to anybody. And you know, that really was a real shot in the arm. It gave me the real motivation to think, well, actually, I'm producing something here that's worthwhile. And that's yeah. something that someone you know, as uh, knowledgeable as, uh, as Elizabeth could make yeah. that comment, I thought, wow, this is great. And she said, you know, I want to see a bit more of this, that, and the other, but, you know, this is fantastic, and, you know, you have got a feature. And ultimately, you know, she gave me an eight-page feature in the magazine, which yeah, was wonderful. Right, yeah. Very, very supportive. Uh, which I, I did go and speak to Elizabeth as well, trying to persuade her to come on this show, funnily enough. <laughs> such, such a lovely lady. Yes. Uh, and we, had, we had a lovely, great conversation. Um, still yeah. waiting for a email to come back. If you're watching this show, Elizabeth, I'm still waiting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's scroll down a little bit further down because I, I found um, that some of the images where you took, um, just wondering if I can find them from the little these little thumbnails, the one where you've caught the words over the door. Oh, yes, yeah, um, towards the bottom, I think. Uh, to the, towards the bottom. And I, I think it, it just, yeah. is, it, is it this one here? Is it this one here? Uh, no, no, I don't think it is. Uh, no, 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 that no. One. Um, I think that I'll just qu quickly flick through them because I read the words out to my uh, father-in-law and, and he said <coughs> how fantastic. Go back to that one, Paul, just a second. Go back to to this one. This is probably not that one, the one before it, I think. Uh, that one? No, sorry, it's the one, that one. That one. Yeah. Yes. This is typical, typical of the miners. And I thought it was probably yeah. one of the most poignant pictures that I took. And this was the last picture yeah. that I put up in the exhibition. Um, and what's happened here is that they've got the year calendar up. And one of the miners um, in, at the end of July has put this sign on the wall that says the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was almost, you know, so poignant to see that. Yeah. But then almost you know, at odds with that, 
was the um, takeaway for the pizzeria that's in the box to the left. Yes, yes, yes. Just almost incongruously sort of just, just dropped in there. Um, yeah. And so that almost was a bit of humour, and that was typical of the place. You know, despite yeah. the fact that it was very sad and it was a very serious time for them, sad time, they had a great time. And the camaraderie there that came through was, was amazing, and that really just typified that for me. Yeah, that you did a fantastic. Uh, you did a fantastic video of this as well, which uh, I think there's there's the words. Yeah, that's uh, the words. yeah the video. <laughs> is, if anybody wants to have a look at the video, it's either on YouTube. Yeah, called Thor's be the end of the mine, or it's on my right. on website. I'm sure you'll put the, the details. And, and, at the end of that video is when the fellas are talking. Yes, and they. Uh, I think the final word was it along the lines. This is history. This is. Yeah, or we are history, something like that, and it yeah. really got. Oh, I had a right lump in my throat when I heard that. Yeah. Let's let's let me just read this out if I can, because it, uh, it's um, I can't actually because it goes a little bit small. But uh, greet your greet your colleague, then smile at him, praise him, wish him well, shake his hand, continually praise your colleague. I can't read that word there. Yeah. Throughout the yeah, shift, the shift. Smile at him hug him pat him in pat him pat him on uh, uh pat him on the back now you're part of the new work community respect each other your colleague is your friend and those are absolutely superb words uh and as you very quite rightly said it doesn't give a matter of a fact that some of the words are not spelled correctly but it just gives a little bit of poignancy to how these guys work together absolutely and, uh, absolutely an absolutely superb project and uh we'll give the book another plug because um i've, I've got a signed copy folks um the, the book is is absolutely superb uh with uh, with more images um, which you published yourself, which um, is is a long it's a long process story which you went through in actual fact to to get the book to print. Um, yeah, which, well, you I must be so experience. proud of it, though, Chris. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I've had exhibitions, and, and you know, so that that was that was easy. I think the key thing for me was that recognizing that it was such an important body of work and yeah. you know, the social and industrial history of the county that I just wanted to share it, and I wanted a couple yeah. of exhibitions. And initially I thought, well, maybe I'll have an exhibition catalog with, you know, 40, 50 images in and that'll be it. But then yeah. I just thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to have a proper book? And so that's what started me off. And of course, I'd never published a book before. So that was a real steep learning curve. But yeah, with the help curve. of um, a, a guy called Darren Chioli Leach, who's a local guy, he's a fantastic photographer. He's a, he does, he's a designer. And he, did, he helped me design the book or he designed it. And uh, I had a little bit of input mm. into it. But basically Darren designed it. And, and did a great job. And what we've done is we've interspersed comments. We recorded about two and a half hours of, um, of interviews with the, with the miners. And we've interspersed yeah. some of their comments into the book to give it a more human yeah. feel. So it's not just a book of photographs. And I think they work really well. And in actual fact, um, just today, I've had some really nice comments from someone who said that he, you know, he sat down with the book today and uh, it, you know, it made him feel quite emotional when he, when he read it. Couldn't agree more with him. Couldn't agree more with him because I think as you go through, um, I, I think we all lived through that that period of time when it was it was really it was a battle on on the fields. It was a battle for the families. It was a battle from from uh, workmate to workmate. And I think it just brought it all back to me because I remember the eighties and this uh, the terrible terrible strikes we were going through. Um, and you saw these these mines. And the workings and then i think at the end the way it's been put together with the portraits of the individuals and then the words and then you start reading the words and uh, i can understand uh, i i too got quite emotional about it uh, and especially in the video where you heard those guys talking yeah, uh, this, yeah. Is, this is history let's video, uh, let's move on to your let's move on to your well. travel travel photography very quickly because sure. this is uh i, I wanted to talk about Thorsby, but I didn't want it to be uh, a sort of one that took over the whole of the show because you, you're a travel photographer and there's some equally fantastic images here, both mono and colour. Um, and uh, am, have I started at the right end of this? Uh, uh, well, the later ones are at the top end, so if you want to go right, back okay. to the Let me, I'll go back to Europe then. I'll stick with Europe 
Um, yeah, so the situation uh, and, uh, this year has been quite fortunate, really. I've had quite a few trips. I went to uh, Venice at the end of January, just before lovely. Uh, just before Carnivali. Uh, then we went to uh, Paris, um, and I've not long been back from this place, uh, Cinque Terre, uh, in Italy, which was just stunning. Um, yeah. And I'm off to Lisbon next month. So quite a few trips recently, yeah. which uh, which is, which has been great. And um, I love Italy. Um, and um, this place was the first time I'd been here, but it was wonderful. Five towns um, which um, are, are on the coast, of, uh, on a stretch of about 10 kilometers of, of coast, just south of the Italian Riviera, um, and uh, wonderful little towns that you can't really drive to them, so you have to get the train, and uh, there's a wonderful train service that uh, just takes you between them. It probably takes about 25 minutes to get from the, the one at the top end, north end to the south. Um, but they come into their own, obviously, uh, either at dawn or dusk, and you've got this wonderful yeah. lighting, the blue hour, and where you've got that balance of, of the um, artificial lighting with the ambient lighting, and uh, there's lovely contrasts. And this is a place called Venazza. Um, and this is Venazza as well from the other side at a different time, looking across into the, uh, the harbour at, uh, at sunset. Uh, and this one is, uh, is Manarola. Yeah, and again, uh, just when the lights are coming on, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, the only thing was, it would have been lovely to have got a little bit of movement in the, in the sea like we have here. And this is an interesting one, because the black and white one there, that one, yeah. it's obviously a long exposure. Um, and that was shot at uh, Monte Rosso al Mare, which is where we were staying, at the northern end of Cinque Terre. And um, uh, this particular day, it was absolutely pouring with rain. And so we went down to the beach and I just thought it's wonderful conditions where you haven't got the harsh lighting to be able to retain the texture and the detail in, in, in this rock. And the sea was quite uh, not rough, but there was a lot more movement in the sea than, than we'd seen. So, um, so the most difficult thing in this situation was trying to keep rain off the front of the lens uh, yeah. on, on, on a one minute exposure. But thankfully managed to do it. I think there's a, there was the odd spot on here, which I had to clone out. But um yeah, it's it's. Uh, I was really quite pleased with uh, with that shot in conditions that you know were pretty difficult. And uh, uh, actually, th that day I got a few others as well. We took we took some shots sitting in a cafe, looking through the window of people walking by, and um, yeah, quite sort of artistic type ones with the brollies and the bright colours, and and that, that worked quite quite nicely. Uh, doing, a bit of, doing a bit of street there, Chris, by the sound of things. I was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was just this was before before dusk, and uh, just looking out to see a very minimalist image. And I think often yeah. it was, you know, less is more. And yeah, uh, quite agree and with simple you. images. And I was listening to your your show with Jonathan Critchley, uh, yeah. a wonderful photographer. And you know, his, his images are very much like that, aren't they? Just picking out yeah. a bit of detail and. And leaving lots of negative space in in the image, um, but yeah. I like, just like the way that the light was just catching on that part of the scene. We got that sliver of silvery light, and the rest of it was you know was blue. So, um, and this is the shot yeah. I'm talking about. It was yeah, exactly right. Out, yeah, boring down. So, just focusing on the raindrops and waiting for someone. And you know what? It's a great example of where um, you know if you wish something, something usually yeah. happens. And I wanted somebody with a bright umbrella to walk through the shot. And not only did I get a bright umbrella, I got, I got a multicolored one. So that was even exactly, and a red, yeah. and a red anorak. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Paris was one. Um, yeah, it is, isn't it? Notre Dame. Yeah. Early spring uh, really was good. Um, and um, I know we're going to get on to um, talk about uh, yeah, a lovely night shot there across. That's um, a seven image stitch panorama. Um, okay. These are all taken on the Fuji. Um, I don't I don't use my other gear now. It's just all Fuji. And uh, this was just stitched together. Um, and while I was in Paris, actually looking at the Eiffel Tower there, um, a little story, I, I, I got up for dawn and went up to the Eiffel Tower and I was um, on the Trocadero um, taking a picture from there towards the Eiffel Tower. And I just noticed in my viewfinder that a guy had wandered into the corner of my picture. So of course, oh crikey, you know, I, 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 the light was pretty good and I thought, well, I hope he's gonna move soon. And of course he started to move and as he walked towards me i thought i'm sure that looks like david noton and um, no. i thought i thought no it, i don't think it is and I, I i sort of know david because i've exhibited alongside him and i've been to quite a few yeah. um 
and um, and as he walked towards me, I, I thought it is. And I, I sort of introduced myself, and we had a good chat. And he was there. He was testing some new gear for Canon, um, and uh, you know he was there specifically without a tripod, um, right? And using fast lenses w without the tripod on the new Canon One DX Mark II. Is it? That's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so he's using that. And uh, anyway, we had a good chat, and he said to me, he said, let, oh, let me take your picture. So he took my picture with the Eiffel Tower in the background using a 35 mil wide open. And uh, you'll see that picture, which is now my Facebook. Um, uh, cover. Oh, okay. So uh, courtesy of David Noton, who was, who was a lovely guy. Yeah. And, I, 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 the way you were going about it, I thought you were saying you were sabotaging your work. How no. dare you? <laughs> No, he, he sort of moved on, and he's I got. A, he's a superb photographer, Dave Norton. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, these these are these are great shots of uh, of yeah, Paris. That's the isolated the, 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 Yeah, it's um, it it, it was. There's something really special about this city. Really yeah. special. Um, we stayed in uh, Saint Germain du Pre, which was only sort of five to ten minutes walk away from here. Um, mm -hmm. And that's at the um, the opera house. And sometimes, yeah. you know, when I go to these sort of places, you know, it, places like Budapest are brilliant because you can use your tripod anywhere in all these types sure. of places. But in Paris, in this particular place, you couldn't. Um, yeah. So the trick really is to go late. Go either very first thing or go late and hang back and then just dive in before they're shutting shop. And this is what I, what I did here. And I was being shouted at. When I, when, I, when I took this picture because otherwise you get people in the picture because they do tours and there's people in the stalls down there or people in one of the other boxes but I was able really to get this and I quite like the way that you've got that curve around on the uh, yes beautiful rail and uh, yeah so it works quite nicely oh, and again yeah. this, one, side. this is another one as well where I was uh, I, I, they sort of shouted at me and um, and then I sort of went back in and I got shouted at again but you know um, it's very it's interesting interesting in this one because I visited this place about three years ago and um, they had at the end of this beautiful this is the uh, Hall of Mirrors isn't it yeah this uh, is the, the back of the um, the, the op in the Opera House again yeah oh the Opera House sorry I thought this was uh, the Palais Versailles oh sorry no, this is the Opera but, House uh, Garnier Opera oh sorry sorry I got it got confused but uh, I was going to say in the Palais Versailles with the uh, with the Hall of Mirrors yeah. thousands of people streaming through this particular uh room so to speak and at the end was this hideous sculpture by some japanese guy which they <laughs> were showing and i thought only in france would they do such a thing you know it was just totally grotesque that they'd shown this particular sculpture at the end of this beautiful mirrors the yeah. hall of mirrors at the palais side sorry yeah. this was in the opera house i can uh, I, I got yeah. confused there uh, but yeah. uh yeah these there is something special about uh, Paris in the terms that I think that what it is is the fact that you've only got that very, very uh, in relatively small area of the uh, the uh, the uh, La Défense area where you have uh, the, the taller buildings. And then apart from one building in the Paris centre, uh, it is all relatively low level. And that's, I think, what gives it its unique uniqueness. Yeah. But, I mean, it's like, um, I mean, I think for me, Probably Venice is the best place on earth yeah. for pictures because you go go around every corner and there's a picture. Something's um, happening. It really is, and I think unless it's bright sunshine and blue skies, you know, any weather is is great for picture taking in uh, in Venice. And um, yeah, you know, it, it, it is just just an incredible place. But um, I did find that Paris as well was was full of opportunities. And I mean, when I was talking oh, yes, yeah. notes on you, know, it was his twentieth visit. Was uh, it really? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I haven't been anywhere near twenty times, but uh, no. Sometimes you get lucky. You know, the city, yeah, place like Venice, like that, the sun's going down, and you know, we just get. Yeah. Um, it's interesting actually because yeah. I, uh, when I was last in Venice, I, I, I was on a cruise and we sailed in on the Queen Mary, the Mary Two, which is the largest Cunard ship. And of course, it's uh, it's a big, big thing. Uh, it's the last time I ever sailed into into Venice because the uh, the locals have uh, made such a demonstration because the wash that this ship creates against the buildings, of course, is, is not really helping things much. No, but no. I've managed to get some great views and shots of uh, of Venice from this very, very far high angle along the, the main canal there, which uh, I was quite pleased about. Yeah. So um, 
up to present day then you've been out of the latest trips that you've done has this been commissioned work or is it work which you've just done which you're hoping uh, to no sell? no no it's work that i've that i've gone on and um you know I'll, I'll use the work and i'll sell some of the work through various means and um you know and and, and obviously i mean i supply i'm a fuji x photographer so i you know, provide fuji with images as well for use in their marketing yeah. here and uh, on the website social media etc um so um yeah but I mean, often I find with travel, I enjoy it so much that almost sometimes I feel that the photography is the icing on the cake because yes. it's fantastic to be there. And, you know, certainly when you're out in places like I've only, only ever done one safari, but out on safari in Kenya or out at dawn in, in Death Valley, it's just an incredible mm. place to be. The fact that you can capture a picture to try and record that uh, is as I say, it's the icing on the cake, and uh, yeah. the trick really is to try and capture that emotion. And I think as a as a travel photographer, you know, every place that you go to has its own particular, unique look, feel, characteristic. And what you're trying to do is capture some of that to convey that to the viewer. Um, That's right. The that they'll either like the picture or or maybe even want to go themselves. Yeah, exactly. So. Um the uh, a, a relatively new venture for you uh, now is the Fuji are starting to do some uh, some what, 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 how do they call it touch it and try try and touch yeah they call them touch and try events so basically um, you know it's it's the, the difficulty for a lot of people who might want to move from a from a heavy DSLR system is that well I've never really used one and and what are the lenses like what's the quality like. That's the big thing. Everybody recognizes the fact that they're smaller, they're lighter, and that's going to be better. But the stumbling block for many people is, yeah, but it's a smaller sensor size, and, and therefore, can the quality be really as good? So yeah. in an attempt to give people that opportunity, um, what, what Fuji have, have done is devised these days, and we ran one before Christmas, which was really successful, and we're just going to do a couple more, and they're on the uh, on the Fuji website, uh, on the Fuji shop. Um, in, they're based in Bedford, the first two on the 2nd and 3rd of June uh, and it gives people the opportunity to come down for the day, meet the, the team at uh, Fuji and myself, um, have a, we have a talk about, um, about Fuji, uh, where they've come from, the equipment, um, I'll do a piece on, on, on my work and how Fuji works for me and, and uh, how I got into it and how that's developed and then what we do is we, we have some lunch and then after lunch we go out and we give everybody a camera, everyone's going to get an X-Pro2 um, uh, they get a selection of lenses to use as well. So if they want to try the 100 to 400, they can do that, you know, or a wide angle lens, whatever they want, they can try that. And we go out, we take some pictures, and they get to keep the uh, the SD card, take that home with them, and then they can have a look and see, you know, see for themselves what the quality is like on on the day. It's a really great way of um, of, of getting people to, uh, to yeah, to try the and, and that's an interesting, that's a nice little touch actually, letting the uh, the uh, uh, the attendee, as I would call it, keeping the SD card because that gives them the opportunity to take them back and and open them up on their own equipment. Uh, yeah. Because there is still this thing that hangs around, and and I've heard even today Zacharias making the comment. Uh, I, I would I really don't know what the the problem is with some people where they turn around and say, oh, I have problems with the Fuji files, uh, the raw file uh, in, in Lightroom. And I've never had the problem. And no. there's loads of people out there that have said the same, but there's the odd one that crops up and says, well, no, it's far better for me to use another editing editing program. So giving that SD card, that's a, that's a nice little uh, giveaway. <clears throat> yeah. which gives the uh, the attendee to sort of say right i'll go and check these out at, at home and then they can compare can't they yes they can Those they're taken with their with their own equipment that's a, that's yeah. a nice touch and, nice. and what about yourself with your personal workshops uh, do you get a chance to do personal workshops yourself chris well, or I'm, I'm, are you I'm too busy to now i'm hoping to start some uh, you know no. having, uh, sort of uh, been involved in quite a few other bits and pieces and got the thorsby thing out of the way it can now yeah. it now leaves me to be able to concentrate on, uh, on on a few other sort of workshops. And what I would like to do is um, I'd like to do the European one. So yes, I mean places like Venice, you know, Santorin, yeah. um, Paris, Budapest would certainly be on on the list. I think for for me, um, you know, I lecture quite widely to photographic clubs, and um, you know, a lot of people ask me there, you know, do you, are you doing workshops? So I know that they'd like to come, and um, you know, I think the important thing is to. Get people to go along and have a good time and whatever gear you've got it doesn't really matter but uh, come along have a good time and uh, you know if you like 
that, that I'm taking, then um, I can hopefully help you to get something similar yourself. Yeah, that's fantastic. Chris, it's been a pleasure to have you on my show this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, talking about the, the colliery there was, uh, for me, just the icing on the cake because I saw the presentation of the show, which was which was fantastic. And uh, also your, your travel photography, which goes without saying, is uh, out of the top slot, as I would say. It's and, been a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I was just going to uh, just a little bit of announcement. Actually, next week there's no show because I'm away on business. I've got to I've got to go up to Liverpool. In actual fact, next week, um, unfortunately, I won't have much chance to walk around that beautiful city. And then a few weeks after that, I'm off to Dubrovnik. So I'm looking forward to. I will have some time there. I'm going to take take the cameras down that day definitely. Yeah. Uh, those few days. But uh, yeah, it, it suffice to say to everyone, uh, you got one more day of the week. Um, if you're going out shooting this weekend, uh, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Leave your camera bag at home. All the best. Bye for now.